Chapter 20 is our final evolution chapter, and it looks at the phylogenies and history of life. We'll closely look at how we choose to organize life on Earth, how we determine or define evolutionary relationships so we can do that, and then what phylogenetic trees can actually look like. Phylogenetic trees are visual representations that scientists use to show evolutionary relationships between different species. Trees can be created and organized differently. Rooted trees, like the one on the left, are linked back to a single ancestor. Unrooted trees, like the one on the right, tie all three domains together, but not to a single organism. Rather, they simply show an or organization of species as they are related to one another. We're going to focus on that rooted tree. So the root of a phylogenetic tree indicates a potential common ancestor and is the organism on the tree that's the oldest or has existed the longest. The branching points are placed when two lineages have diverged from one another. You can think of the branch points like speciation events. One line or species branches into two or more species after that branch point. If the line has branched off relatively early in this particular tree's life and hasn't changed since, or at least that species hasn't changed much since its original speciation event, we call it a basal taxon. When there are two species that have diverged off of one branch, we refer to those species as, six, as sister taxa. These sister taxa species may have a lot in common still, and they might remain closely related, but they're two clearly defined species. A polytomy is when one species undergoes something like adaptive radiation and becomes many species in one singular spe speciation event. Think about Darwin's finches. That's a great example. So when you're looking at trees, this is what you should be considering. This ladder-like phylogenetic tree of vertebrates is rooted in an organism that lacked the original vertebral column. At each branch point, organisms with different characteristics are placed into different groups based on what they share. These ladder-like trees tend to be a favorite of students because they're a little easier to follow. When you look at trees, we can actually add some more layers of organization if we'd like. The most general classification for living things on Earth that, be, that could be included in a tree is the kingdom. There are three types of kingdoms, bacteria, and, bacteria, archaea, and eukarya. We learned about this way, way, way back in the beginning of this book. Within those three domains, they each have their own kingdoms, of which there are six. And then phyla, classes, orders, families, genuses, and species. There are more phyla than kingdoms, and there are more classes than phyla, and on down the line. The groups get more and more specific and exclusive as you work towards a particular species. In this instance, they show you how we got to Homo sapiens. These individual groups don't have exact definitions, you just know that one is more exclusive than the next on the list. Here's an example of that exclusivity as we work from domain eukarya all the way down to subspecies Canis lupus familiaris, or your dog. When we have domain eukarya, that's a reference to any cell that's eukaryotic. Kingdom animalia is a reference to animals. Those are things that are heterotrophic and multicellular. Chordates have a nerve cord. Mammals have hair and give uh, live birth. Carnivores eat meat. The canidae is a reference to a lot of physical features. Canis is a reference to some more specific dog features. Canis lupus is when you get rid of things like jackals. And then the subspecies of the familiar familiaris real refers to domesticated dogs. The lists of characteristics that it takes to be in genus Canis and species Canis lupus are actually incredibly specific. This shows you what these levels of organizations can allow us to do. This could be transferred into something that looks just like a regular phylogenetic tree. The next section of the book discusses two different options for considering similarities when you're thinking about grouping organisms. You can group them by morphologic information and genetic information. We have to discern how organisms are related, and while it may be simple to do so, prior to constructing a tree, if we have any hope of really getting at how the tree should look, we need to consider all potential information. Homologous structures can help us to get a good start, though. For instance, there's something like birds and bats. Birds and bats have wings that have extremely similar internal structures that give them their function, so it shows us they probably have similar evolutionary paths. However, on a tree, they're actually quite, distant, quite distantly related, especially when you consider some of the things about them. 
there are even some more misleading appearances, like the one seen here. When you consider underlying structures and talk about wings of insects, they're really quite different. They aren't built the same, the uses are just the same. So this shows you that making trees based on homologous structures or morphologies might actually lead you astray. Birds, bats, and insects are very, very, very distantly related, but they have similar functions. Making molecular comparisons is a far safer bet for creating an accurate tree. With advanced DNA technology, we can compare entire genomes of organisms to one another. This process or study is referred to as molecular systematics. Organisms that share more of their DNA are more closely related. There's a kind of a neat use to this idea, and it was discovered by a research team in China. They knew that a particular plant had antifungal properties. That can be really helpful for a variety of reasons. And they essentially used a genome searching tool to figure out which plants in an environment it was related to, even if they looked different. And the related plants could possibly also contain those helpful antifungal genes. They ended up finding healthy, local, related plants that have these valuable properties, and it was a far more cost-effective manner than traditional research methods, testing everything around it just to see if it just so happened to be antifungal. So there are some neat things that we can do when finding evolutionary relationships. Cladistics are a low-tech but efficient way to create trees. These trees are created by grouping categories. These trees are created by grouping organisms by creating categories based on what everyone has and then moving towards the more specific. It's not as efficient as the molecular systematics format of creating trees, but it's what we commonly do in the classroom because it's easy to see orders of relatedness and kind of understand this concept of inclusive groups and exclusive groups. All of these individuals are included in the group vertebrata because they all have vertebrae. However, only the lizards, rabbits, and humans include, are included in the group amniota, and that's because we all have amniotic sacs either inside our eggs or around our young. We commonly study organisms based on their clade. Cladistics also includes the study of clated groups, that means that we're just studying a group that comes from a single branch point of a tree. You may end up studying just a single branch or maybe a group of branches, but notice that they all share a common ancestor. Studying cladistics or discussing clades commonly comes up when you do any research in evolutionary biology. The concept of working on organizing life into trees is an old one. Charles Darwin, who wasn't a visual learner and actually didn't draw much, created this tree on the left that allowed him to organize his thoughts and see how species might have come from a common ancestor. We've come a long way from this original chicken scratch. What we have found, though, is that evolutionary history is actually more complicated, and it's not as easy as the branch-to-branch -branch method. That's because genes can move horizontally. We call this horizontal gene transfer. Not every gene in a population's gene pool comes from that population's direct ancestor. Some genes can actually be introduced by outside forces, like those listed here. Think about tying a fishing line from one branch of the tree in your backyard that's nearer to the ground to the very top branch of the tree. The tree of life is a little bit more intertwined than we originally thought. Horizontal gene transfer is better understood in prokaryotes. Here you can see four different mechanisms. Prokaryotes can actually uptake genetic information from their environment around them. They can be given new genetic information by a virus. They can share genetic information by something called a pillus. It's kind of like building a temporary tunnel to the little bacteria that's next to you and a whole variety of other processes. As you see with the eukaryotes, we have four different listed mechanisms. Two are listed as unknown. We do know, though, that there are eukaryotic cells that share genes with creatures that they are very distantly related to. Here's a neat example of this phenomenon, and it gives the red color to some aphids, the little bugs that you see crawling around on these plants. The coloration comes from a gene that's actually been shared by a fungus. So this ability definitely isn't any other members of this insect family. It's pretty neat to think that genes from a fungus can be active in an insect. Those red aphids seem to be more resistant to insecticides too, and they have a greater chance of survival in harsh environments. So maybe, the ad maybe being red isn't necessarily the advantage, but some other protein that's coded in a little bit of DNA that came over with the red gene. Another knot in the pretty tree that we would like to draw for evolution is the existence of endosymbiotes. 
something referred to as genetic fusion can occur, and that's the total fusion of two functional separate genomes into one new amped up genome. This idea is an example of that. There's a theory that both mitochondria and chloroplasts are actually endosymbiotes, which means that they used to exist as separate individuals, or not really individuals, but as separate entities, and that they were brought into a cell as maybe a food particle, found to be incredibly helpful and actually kept around. One of the major points of data that backs this up is the fact that chloroplasts and mitochondria actually carry their own genome and are responsible for their own replication. You can even take it a step further. Some people suggest that the eukaryotic nucleus actually came from the fusion of two different archaeal and bacterial genomes. For those of you who might be interested in micro, gram-negative bacteria, they have two separate membranes in there. Some people suggest that that membrane came from two different things being fused together. So there's a lot of crossover in our nice tree. This image expands a little bit on those models for evolution when it comes to endosymbiotes. There are three hypotheses. Some suggest that the nucleus was the very first thing to be engulfed by a larger cell and making it an eukaryotic cell. That's the little purple dot. So we believe there was a large cell that engulfed a nucleus, and that made that cell particularly more efficient. It then engulfed the mitochondria. It fed off the mitochondria's energy, and the cell fed the mitochondria oxygen, making the cells we currently know today. Some individuals believe that the mitochondria was the first thing engulfed into the cell, and then eventually it happened upon a nuclei, and we have our current cell. And other individuals believe that the eukaryotic cell evolved entirely on its own, and then eventually found mitochondria in the environment and started capturing more of them to create a more energy efficient system. There are good arguments for all three of these particular ideas. The one that I was taught carries a little bit more weight is that nucleus first hypothesis. What results from all this work is a tree of life that doesn't look a little bit like the classic tree drawn by third graders, but rather a multi-trunk ficus tree. Personally, I'm thankful for it because it makes the study of that potential tree so much cooler. You can see all of the different lines of crossover between our three domains of life. Maybe though, we'll find out that that cool tree actually needs to be let go entirely for an updated idea, the ring of life. The nice thing about scientists is that we can run with an idea, explore it, and realize that a new one is actually a little bit more sound, study it, accept it, and then simply move on. That might be where we're headed. Maybe the three domains came from the same collection of basic primitive cells that took their populations on their own evolutionary paths. Those evolutionary paths have led to the diversity in the world that we've seen today, and that's where we're actually going to head next. We'll see where those paths have taken us.